Hello, I'm Thomas from Medieval Review, and in this video series we're going to talk about sword dynamics. Now the topic of sword dynamics is honestly a very complex one. It requires a really good understanding of both physics and mathematical modeling. Now this is something that I tried to speak to about six months ago in my own small video that I talked about uh, the sword agility graphs and how to create them. And this was based on my own research and honestly it fell very shy of where it really needed to. Thankfully, we can look to those who have spearheaded the effort of bringing sword dynamics to the forefront of our modern understanding of what it means to make a good sword. Now, these two individuals, Vincent Le Chevalier and Peter Johnson, uh, have done a lot of work and has recently been published on Ensis Subcalo. And this webpage uh, not only includes a brief description of what sword dynamics really means, but it also includes a tool that can be used to create what's essentially your, is your own sword agility graphs. So what I'm going to talk about in this uh, video series is really more the research that they did. And uh, I'm going to speak a little bit to interpreting and understanding sword dynamics. And this can all be researched and read on that webpage. I'm also going to talk about how to do measurements on swords so you can actually input these uh, measurements very accurately into the tool and get your own sword agility graph. And then I'm also going to talk about how to then refine that sword agility graph to look a little bit more presentable, much like it is in the book, The Sword, Form and Thought, from the Klingon Museum exhibition. Now again, I want to stress that all of this work is thanks to, well honestly, the hard work from Vincent Le Chevalier and Peter Johnson. Vincent worked mainly on the mathematical and physics research side. He's the one who developed the tool and has actually done this publication. Uh, but Peter Johnson helped him greatly in giving him very valuable insight on swords, as well as providing him with a lot of data that he could then pass through these tools and try to build a better understanding. And really, these two individuals should get all the credit for their hard work. I'm just trying to do my part to better understand for the community what this all means and how this can be useful to us. So let's dive right in. Throughout this video series, I will be using this Albion Lichtenauer Blunt Training Long Sword in order to uh, not only demonstrate certain aspects of sword dynamics, but also uh, take measurements on and build the sword agility graph. So you have a constant model with which to reference, and you can see from beginning to end the process that we would go through to generate this graph. I'm also using this sword, one reason, because it's one of my favorite swords that I own, but also because, well, it's designed by Peter Johnson, and what better way to thank him for his great work and his assistance in bringing us these concepts of sword dynamics than to use one of his own sword designs. So, as we begin to talk about it, let's actually talk about what sword dynamics actually are. Quoting from Vincent Le Chevalier. The quality of a sword is often described by its metallurgical properties, the purity of the steel and the sharpness, hardness, and resilience of the blade. These are naturally important qualities for a sword, but the way it behaves when put in motion, how it responds to sudden changes in direction, is equally, or perhaps even more, critical. A sword made of soft iron, but with a good balance, will be a superior weapon to one that is made of fine steel, of excellent temper, but that is sluggish and unresponsive. It is often said that a good sword is like an extension of the arm, even though it would be more correct to say that it should be like an extension of the mind. This property of the weapon can be described as its balance. However, that word may bring to mind a balancing scale resting in static equilibrium, which may not be the most apt image. Since swords are made for swift movements, we reach a better understanding by considering their dynamic properties. Some of these essential aspects that interact in establishing them are mass, overall length, the proportion between blade and hilt, flexibility, and perhaps most importantly, how the mass is distributed along the length of the weapon. These aspects are undoubtedly less accessible to the eye than the external shape and typology of the sword. Nonetheless, they can be documented and communicated with the help of careful measurements and dedicated tools. 
By entering measurements into the Weapon Dynamics computer, you will be able to produce graphs similar to those published in the catalog of the exhibit, The Sword, Form and Thought. The graphs demonstrate agility by an oval and hourglass shapes. The shape and size of the oval describes the relative ease by which the hilt can be accelerated in a straight line in different directions. The hourglass shape describes the agility of the sword in rotation around the hilt. The size of the arc increases with increased agility. Of course, the motion of the sword in use will most often be a combination of these two basic modes of motion. The diagram also includes a curve of effective mass. The effective mass in any given location is the amount of mass that must be displaced to set that part in motion or to stop it in defense or attack. At the point of balance, it is the total mass of the sword and it will decrease towards the pommel and point at a rate that depends on mass distribution. The goal is to obtain a numerical and visual representation of a sword balance which can be related to our tactile impression, sword in hand. So when you're looking at these agility graphs, the best way to think about it is just like this. The oval represents that simple lateral movement. Of course, the oval is shorter on the x-axis and much larger on the y. What this represents is that if you put what's essentially the same amount of effort into moving the sword in a lateral direction via the hilt, uh, up and down is actually much easier to do than on that x-axis. Uh, that's because of how you're having to displace some of the mass of the sword. And then the hourglass shape is essentially talking about this kind of rotational motion. And look, again, the larger the hourglass shape, it means it's much easier to actually rotate. Now, technically, that would be done with a sword like this with two hands, which usually results in a much larger uh, hourglass shape, much better agility with the blade. And as was noted by Vincent, of course, these things are never actually done independently of each other. When using a sword, it's a combination of the two. So you really can't just take one over the other. You have to use both the oval and the hourglass shape to really understand how the sword will actually feel in hand. And this can be a very difficult thing if you haven't handled a lot of variety of swords uh, because, well, there may not be that big of a difference between the agility, but the more swords you handle, and especially the more you get to compare against agility graphs, the more you can actually read the agility graphs and actually understand what it means. So one of the challenges for the community as a whole will be to find a way of really truly communicating that to people who have honestly not touched as many swords as more avid collectors. Now, um, when you're looking at that mass distribution chart, uh, essentially what it means is that when you find at the point of balance, the rough point of balance on a sword, seems to be, well, right about here on this one, um, this is going to be the most mass, because honestly, this is where I feel the full mass of the sword. Uh, generally speaking, anytime you take a mass measurement outside of the center of mass, you're actually taking two mass measurements one at either side. And depending on the distance from the actual center of mass, you have different effective masses. So while it felt very heavy on my one finger in the middle, now that it's being supported by two fingers, it's much lighter on this one finger, and I'm actually on a part of the blade that has a much smaller effective mass. Not only that, but the use of the sword means that this effective mass will essentially only transfer uh, a certain amount of the overall mass of the sword to a target, both to either uh, transfer the mass to the target or for the target to stop the mass of the blade. So if I have a sword that weighs, let's say roughly 1.6 kilograms, well, it won't take 1.6 kilograms of uh, force to really stop it. You have to consider the, uh, you know, the actual acceleration and the velocity, um, but the effective mass will always be uh, much less to stop it at an extremity than it will be right at the center of mass. So there is a certain amount of effective mass that can actually be transferred, uh, and that usually ends up correlating to a sweet spot, the sweet spot that everyone always talks about on swords, and we'll actually talk a bit about that uh, in a little bit. So when you're reading at least those moments of the graph, those uh, the ovals, the hourglasses, and the effective mass curve, that's uh, the general understanding you need to be able to glean from it, is that the overall mass in the center is not going to be the same as it goes to the extremities, and then again, movement both laterally as well as rotationally uh, is described by different swords in different ways. 
So of course, there's more in a sword agility graph beyond just the effective mass curve as well as the dynamic agility properties of the sword. There are points along the, the sword that are denoted and I wanted to be able to speak to what those were, how to find them and what they mean. Uh, I also want to note that as I'm doing this, uh, I'm using this blunt long sword and because it's blunt there are certain th ways I'm handling it that are may not be safe if you're doing the same type of test with a sharp sword so I will note here and I'll probably reiter reiterate it a lot uh, be very careful if you're doing this with a sharp sword because we're going to be holding the sword in some very uh, non-traditional manners and we're going to be working a lot along the blade so if you're doing this with a sharp uh, please take extra precautions so uh, the first thing we're going to look at is really quite simple. It's a center of mass. Um, the center of mass is pretty easy to find in general, and that is where can you balance it so that uh, it doesn't fall one way or the other. Um, there's much more accurate ways to get, gather that information that we will go over in the, uh, the next video, um, but certainly just for a general purpose, it's somewhere uh, close to the hilt, usually between four to six inches out, depending on the type of sword. Uh, the next item that I want to talk about is the pivot point. Now this is a rather difficult thing to actually find accurately, but I'm going to show you kind of how this works. Now again, uh, if you're doing this with a sharp sword, you want to be extra careful. Um, but I'm going to hold the sword loosely in between two fingers. What I'm actually doing here is I'm holding it about a centimeter from the cross guard. This actually represents where if I was normally holding the sword where I would actually grip it with my forefinger. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is because that's where most of the grip would actually happen, generally speaking, usually with the fore and middle finger. Um, certainly you can choke higher up on the cross guard when holding a sword, um, but generally speaking, to keep your hands safe behind the cross guard, you tend to actually grip a little bit further back. So I'm gripping it about a centimeter back, and I'm holding it as lightly as possible. It has to be held lightly because if you don't hold it lightly, um, you can actually mess up uh, the discovery of the pivot point. So holding it here, I begin to just kind of rock it back and forth. And I, I try to do this quickly and not holding it too tightly. And what you'll see is uh, a rotation point begins to appear uh, where the blade doesn't really move much. It rotates kind of around this point. Um, and that is my four uh, pivot point. So I'm gripping here close to the hilt and closer to the tip I have a pivot point. And you can see what happens if I begin to grip too tightly. It actually kind of changes it and messes up the way that the sword actually moves. So again, hold it as lightly as possible without dropping it and just kind of begin to rotate it as quickly as you can while still maintaining a fairly decent motion. Uh, the next thing I will note is that you can actually take this uh, measurement this way, holding it from the side and actually rocking it back and forth this way. I find that a little bit harder uh, because the cross guard is in the way that way, so I find it much easier to take this measurement. And in my experience, you can take it accurately either way. Um, so I prefer the one that's a little bit easier for me and a little bit more apparent. Um, so there you go, you found one of the pivot points. The next pivot point we're actually gonna take is actually gonna be up here closer to the pommel. And the reason for that is if I'm holding the sword uh, like a normal person with my left hand, uh, my pinky is going to be right there uh, at that point on the grip. Um, that's actually a leverage point. So when I'm moving the sword with like a lever action with my left hand, I'm really only doing so mostly with that part of my, my left hand, that pinky part. Um, and so that's gonna become the second uh, pivot point we take is at that leverage point. Um, if you're doing this on a, on a, a single-handed kind, of, kind of style arming sword, um, you could do so again, the second pivot point close to the pommel where your pinky would be. Um, the tool that Vincent Le Chevalier created uh, can actually take this into account. So if you only take one pivot point, which I would not recommend, I'd actually always suggest you take at least two. Um, it will actually just add in a second pivot point assumed from uh, nine centimeters from uh, the cross essentially, which is roughly where you would probably see it on many single-handed swords. Uh, now again, you can take these pivot points anywhere, but we're gonna do so right here at that second point. And you'll, you'll notice again, I grip softly and I just begin to rock it. And you'll notice that now there's a new spot where the sword is not rotating nearly as much. Um, and again, if I were to grip real tightly, it kind of messes everything up. So 
Got to grip as loosely as possible and rock it back and forth. And that, that spot is obviously not as close to the tip. It's much closer to the cross guard. Um, and that is my secondary pivot point. So there's always an associated pair. You have a pivot point on the handle that's associated to one on the blade. And, uh, and uh, the, obviously the, 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 the grip is much shorter than the entire blade, so the ratio between where you're taking the measurement will also be radically different, generally speaking. Um, but the further away from the cross, the closer to the cross on the blade, the associated pivot point will be. Uh, the next item I want to talk about is a vibration node. Uh, here's how you get the vibration node. It's actually pretty simple. You just kind of hold the sword uh, you know, fairly lightly, um, and you just hit the side, strike the side of it. And what you'll see, it kind of naturally appears, there's this part in the oscillation of the blade that doesn't really quite vibrate as much. And, uh, and that associates actually with a spot on the grip that should do the same thing, which is kind of hard to see as I'm holding this, um, but it seems to be right about here on this sword. Um, right here kind of in the middle and it's very likely on a, on a long handled sword like a long sword that it actually appears somewhere between where your two hands would be um, but uh, again you will have uh, associated pairs of these vibration nodes and then, of course this might be kind of hard to see on the camera so I'm gonna try to get it as best I can but you can see it's just not vibrating as much right about see right about here ish um, and so it, it's really easy to find again if you're doing this with a sharp sword be really careful because hitting the blade with a sharp sword you want to be want to be careful not to cut yourself um, but those pivot points what they or sorry what these vibration nodes what they basically mean to me is um, these are areas where the amount of impact to the sword blade uh, is ideal and what I mean by this is where that vibration node is in the handle is where uh, when the blade is hit, it transfers the least amount of shock to your hands. Um, so if it hits the sword and you're not holding it where that vibration node is, you're gonna feel that a lot more in your hands. In a long sword, uh, thankfully if you're holding it with two hands, like you should be, um, you actually feel less because both hands are absorbing the shock. Uh, but on a single handed especially, you actually almost always find that vibration node sits right where uh, the hand would actually sit. Um, where it's on the blade, what this really can kind of roughly be interpreted as is kind of the sweet spot. Now, a lot of people talk a lot about how you can find the sweet spot on the sword. That is, where is the spot that feels like you're transferring the most energy of the cut from the sword uh, to your target? Um, and there's a lot of different ways to get that. But certainly, I think this is a fairly accurate way. It's a general gauge. Uh, although it is worth noting that a vibration node that's hit on the flat is actually slightly different from that that's hit on the edge. Um, and it's hard to find one hit on the edge, hence why uh, we're doing so on the flat. They're a rough approximation to the same general area, uh, so they're good enough, right? Um, it's a lot harder to get those other measurements, so it's really easy to get this measurement and have a general understanding of exactly where that general sweet spot on the sword would be. So ideally, if you know where these two things are, um, you're gonna hit with that sweet spot part of the blade, and there's gonna be so little shock to your hand that you're transferring the maximum amount of energy uh, to your target. So that's how I interpret the vibration nodes, uh, and they're kind of just an interesting aspect of a sword blade. So there you go, those are kind of the additional items that you see on a sword agility graph. And uh, in the next video, we're going to then take a closer look at how to more accurately uh, find these spots, measure them, and enter them into the uh, Sword Dynamics uh, computer that was created by Vincent Le Chevalier. And we will uh, take a look at generating our own sword agility graph. So see you in the next video. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can also check out Medieval Review on Patreon.